So hello Achievers, today we are with a new guest. I am in Chicago in the hotel and I have a new guest called Ruben. Is Ruben Gonzalez, the huge man and his story is awesome. We will discover that. So hello Ruben. Hi, how are you David? I'm fine, and you? <laughs> oh, terrific, thank you. Can you introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, le le there, there's other guys that have done more than four Olympics. It's, it's rare, but it's been done. But I'm the only one that's done four Olympics, each in a different decade, okay? Yes. The, the, the first one was in the 1980s. The second one, Albertville, France, uh, in uh, 92. And then um, uh, Salt Lake City was the third one. That was a new decade. And then Vancouver, by two months, it was one more decade, right? And uh, I tell people, it doesn't mean I'm good, just means I'm old. <laughs> but um, I, I speak, uh, you know, for the last 15, for the last uh, 11 years, I've been speaking, sharing my story all, all around the world. Uh, I got to speak in Devon, in, right outside of Geneva in France uh, last year. And best bread in the world. They could have, man, they could have... <laughs> Paid me zero dollars, just fly me and let me eat all the bread. But um, uh, I, I just share my story and I just try to uh, help people learn how to fight for their goals, how to fight for their dreams, yes, and how that. to become unstoppable. Yes. And uh, I believe that the more we uh, share to uh, you know as many people as we can, that's how we can make the, the world a better place. Just teach people how, how to make their dreams come true. Cool. What did you do before to be an Olympic champion? And why did you start? And how did you start? <laughs> okay. Well, it's a crazy story. I was, I'm not a great athlete, okay? I can't jump high. I can't run fast. I'm not super strong. I'm like your neighbor, okay? Really. <laughs> and it, during school, uh, I was always the last kid that they chose for teams. You know, whenever they're getting together to play a game, I'm the last one. And uh, <laughs> yeah, and the team captain that chose me always said the same thing. Oh, got to get Ruben again. And that was the story of my life. It was terrible. But I had a dream. When I was 10 years old, I saw the Olympics on TV, and I just loved it. And I read everything about the Olympics. And I was an Olympic expert, but I didn't believe it's possible because, you know, I'm, I'm not even getting to play sports in school. And when I was 21, the Olympics uh, roll around again, and I saw Scott Hamilton, who's a very famous uh, figure skater. And um, he's, only, he's a tiny, short, short little guy, okay? Uh, only weighed about 100 pounds, 18-year-old kid, and he wins the gold medal. And when I saw him win that medal, I said to myself, if he can go to the Olympics, I can too. I'll be in the next ones no matter what. I just have to find a sport. And so the belief came, right? And so uh, you, you know, when you're trying to reach your goals, you have to have belief and you have to have desire, right? If you believe something, then you'll take action, right? Yes. And, but <laughs> everything is, is hard at the beginning. No matter what you do, it's always going to be hard at the beginning, so you have to have desire. If, you're, if you have enough desire, if you want it badly enough, then nothing will make you quit, and you'll stay uh, focused on it long enough to learn the skills that you need to you know, move forward. And so um, I saw Scott Hamilton. I thought, if he can do it, I can too. Uh, at the time, I lived in Houston, Texas, which is super hot and flat and uh, <laughs> humid. I mean, it's like living in Sicily, okay? And... Um, uh, I didn't even know what snow looked like, uh, but I, it didn't matter. I, I picked the luge because I thought, you know, looks like a lot of broken bones. Maybe there'll be a lot of quitters. I, I just won't quit. I'll, I'll outlast everybody. Uh, when I was young, my dad uh, got me to read biographies. He said, Ruben, if you will study the lives of great people, you will figure out what works and what doesn't work in life because success leaves clues. And so he said, read biographies. You'll figure out what works and what doesn't work in life. And I started reading biographies, and I realized that perseverance, refusing to quit, that's rule number one. And so in high school, my, after reading all these books, I, I, in the fifth grade, I made a decision. I said, from today on, Ruben doesn't quit anything. In high school, my nickname was Bulldog, right? Because they said, <laughs> man, you're like a bulldog. You never let go, you know, if you grab. And so I said, yeah. And so when I picked the luge, I thought, I have to find a tough sport. So there will be many quitters and I can rise to the top, right? I would just not quit. So I went to Lake Placid, New York. Uh, this is a little town in New York where they had the Olympics in 1932 and then in 1980. Uh, uh, and uh, at first they wouldn't take me. Like, I was 21 years old. They said, you're too old, man. You should have 10 years experience by now. There's no way. And they're laughing at me. And many times people will laugh at your, at your, uh, at your dreams, right? Yes. Uh, average people will laugh at your dreams because they don't believe. 
And so, uh, but you just keep, you know, don't worry. It's impossible. And so, yeah, you just, yeah, you cannot take, I, I knew that hanging up the phone, if I hung up the phone, it's all over, right? And so I, uh, I thought to myself, I have to, I have to find a way, I have to make friends with this guy, I have to think of a way to, you know, get in and get into the training. And when he found out that I was born in Argentina, because I was born in Argentina, my dad and my family moved to the United States when I was a little boy, six years old. I told him I was born in Argentina just because I'm telling him my life story just to make friends with him, right? And in the background, <laughs> in my mind, I'm thinking there's always a way. There's got to be a way. If I don't quit, I'll find a way because, you know, God always gives me a way. And so, so I'm telling him my life story. I tell him that I'm born in Argentina. And he says, Argentina, if you'll go for Argentina, we'll help you. I said, why? <laughs> Before you weren't going to help me at all. And he said, well, the sport of luge is in danger of getting kicked out of the Olympics because we don't have enough countries that are doing the luge. We're recruiting. We're looking, you know, and to be in the Olympics, you have to be a world sport. And luge is just, you know, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, you know, Russia, U.S., just a few. And so he said, if you will go for Argentina and somehow we'll train you, you travel with the U.S. team, you train with us, if somehow... And by some kind of miracle, uh, in four years, you can be in the top 50 in the world, right? Because you have to be in the top 50 to go to the Olympics. Uh, and he said, and, and Germany has 60,000 losers, but don't think about that, right? <laughs> he said, if we can get you to the top 50 in the world, you get to go to the Olympics, lose gets an extra country, and that helps the U.S. And I said, I don't understand. How's that going to help the U.S.? And he said, simple. Think about it. We're... We are putting millions of dollars into the U.S. team. We're investing in our team so that a few years from now we can develop our, our players and uh, so we can win some medals in the future. But if we're not in Olympic sport because there's not enough countries, it's money down the drain. So will you help, you know, will you go for Argentina? And I said, of course I'll go for Argentina. I'll go for Pakistan. I don't care, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even care what sport. If they would have had, uh, you know, Olympic chess, you know, uh, man, I'd take that. But uh, and so he said, hey, before you come to Lake Placid, you need to know two things. Number one, if you want to do it at your age and you want to do it in just four years, it's brutal, brutal. Nine <laughs> out of ten people quit. <laughs> well, when he said that, I started smiling. I thought, yes. wow, this is perfect <laughs> for my plan, right? <laughs> so I, I said, what's the second thing? He said, expect to break some bones. And I said, great, great. And he got real quiet on the phone for a long time. And finally, he comes back. And he says, man, what's wrong with you? You know, I told you you're going to break bones and that makes you happy. Are you crazy or something? And I said, look, I hope it's 10 times harder what you're telling me. Because the harder it is, the easier it is for me because I'm not a quitter. I'm bulldog. Okay. And so I was praying that it would be so hard that maybe some of these Germans would quit. Yeah? <laughs> but uh, I didn't pray hard enough because they all showed up. They always show up. Right. But he didn't understand the man on the phone. He said, man, uh, you know, uh, he must have thought I was a cocky Texan or something. He goes, well, come on down. You know, uh, we'll see you in a few weeks. Click. And he hangs up. And so I go and I start training. And it's only two or three months after I saw Scott Hamilton on TV. I'm in Lake Placid learning how to luge on wheels. You first learn on wheels, on concrete, right? Because it's the springtime. The ice is gone. And you're going 50 miles an hour, 70 kilometers per hour. Um, and we're, all we're wearing is tennis shoes, shorts, and a T-shirt, right? And a helmet, but the, the helmet is just decoration, okay? It doesn't help much if you crash. And, they, and, and you start training. And, it's, and it was brutal. And everybody in my group quit. You know, after the first year, uh, I was in a group with 15 other guys that were learning. They all quit. And they all had great excuses for quitting, right? Oh, it's too far <laughs> away. Oh, I miss my so family. Odd. It's too expensive. I don't like the luge. I didn't like the luge either, okay? I was killing myself out there. Uh, crashing like crazy. Um, the, first, the first two years, I was crashing four out of five times. Four out of five. I mean, that hurt. But I kept at it, right? And after a while, I was crashing three out of five. And then one out of ten. And then after a while, one out of twenty. And after two, the end of two years... I was crashing one out of a hundred, right? Now it's time to fine tune, right? To perfect, right? And, uh, and I started competing internationally because you have to have a world ranking. And, uh, and four years, the fourth year, I was able to make the top 50 and I got to go to Calgary in the Olympics. And you're, you're walking, you're marching into the opening ceremonies and you feel so happy, you know, you feel so proud. And at the same time, I felt a little bit sad uh, for these guys that quit because they become my friends. 
And I thought, wow, what are they feeling like today? You know, they're watching it on TV. I bet it hurts so much, I bet you they have to change channels, right? I bet it hurts so much that they cannot watch the Olympics for the rest of their life. And on their deathbed, they'll be thinking, why? Why did I have to quit, right? And I paid a huge price to make my dream come true. I just told you a little bit. Okay. People say, Ruben, you have sponsors? Who's your sponsor, Ruben? Coca-Cola? Pepsi? Nike? <laughs> my sponsors? <laughs> Visa and MasterCard. My own. Yeah. <laughs> I paid everything with my Visa. At the end of the Olympics, I'm tens of thousands of dollars in debt. Right? And then you have to start paying it off. But that's the price of success. You know, you have to be willing to do whatever it takes for as long as it takes to get the job done. And uh, people ask me, well, what do I have to do? You know, can I, can I succeed? Can I do it? You know, what's, how hard is it going to be? I said, it's going to be really hard. You know, success is tough. It's simple, <laughs> but it's difficult. Okay. It's simple, but it's difficult. And so you have to work. You have to outwork the competition. You have to give everything you have. Your attitude needs to be, if, if I could possibly be asked to do a hundred different things, right, to make this dream come true, your attitude needs to be, you have to be willing to do all of them. Life will very seldom ask you to do all 100, but you don't know which ones it's going to ask you. So your attitude needs to be, I'm going to do, I'm willing to do anything, right? And if, because if you are willing to do all of them, but number 87, no, I'm not doing 87, 87 is too tough, then you're in trouble because that's the one you're going to have to do. Right. So, so it's whatever it takes. You know, you have what it takes. It's possible. It's not easy, but it's possible. And uh, and don't worry about your probabilities. Right. You know, probability, you know, what percentage, what are the chances that somebody like me can be in the Olympics? Maybe one percent, maybe half a percent. Right. Well, if I focused on that, I would quit. Right. But by by um, commitment, committing more, by being willing to fight, fight, fight and never quit. All of a sudden, the probabilities go up. If I quit, guess what? Probability zero, right? So you focus on the possibility. Is it possible? Yeah, it's possible. Is it probable? No, but I control probability. Understand? Yes, so you I understand. focus on the dream. So um, you are saying a lot of things uh, through your story. It's very inspiring. I, I love your story. <laughs> uh, I, I am sure. I know you. I, I know you. I can tell you know what, uh, what you are made up of. And we were trying to to connect, right? To what time can, what time, and I'm traveling, I'm speaking a lot, you're traveling a lot, and we were trying to find a, pl a time to, to make this, this, this uh, interview. And I know that if the only time was three o'clock in the morning, we would have both made it happen, right? Yes. Yes. Because of course, hey, who cares? <laughs> I can sleep tomorrow. I can sleep after I'm dead, right? <laughs> That's right. It's, so it's a willingness. It's not some people they think, well, if I cannot do it, uh, you know, it has to be between nine in the morning and, and five o'clock in the afternoon because otherwise, you know, that's a that's work time. No, that's work time for average people. Not and I, I, I love the, the the last thing you said, it was um the price you have to pay. Uh, it's very inspiring. Uh, you just wrote a book called Becoming Unstoppable, and I love this concept. <laughs> <laughs> so how can you, how can we become unstoppable? Do you have some how can keys? You yes. Okay. Unstoppable means, you know, that, uh, and I tell, I tell my kids, I tell ever since they were very little, I tell them, look, life is tough, okay? And we're going <laughs> to have to be tougher. Yeah. Yeah. I prepare them, right? I don't tell them it's going to be easy because if I do that, they will not fight. Right. So some life is tough. We have to be tougher. I asked Grayson, you got to see my son Grayson earlier. And uh, uh, even when he was four years old, I asked him, hey, what are two things that Gonzalez's don't do? And he goes, they don't they don't make excuses. That's right. What else? They don't quit. That's right. OK, you can go play now. Right? <laughs> yeah, but that's a decision. You know, we don't quit. We don't make excuses. Right. And so that's part of being unstoppable. Another big part is is, uh, you know, you, I believe that God puts a dream in your heart, okay? And God gives you talents, you know, gives everybody different talents. And the, the, the talent that you have, David, is what you're going to need to make your dream come true. But it's not going to be easy. It's going to be hard. You're going to have to work like crazy, okay? So, because so, it's going to be challenges. And the challenges is what makes you strong. 
That's what makes you grow as a person. And so the reason God puts that dream in front of you is like a carrot in front of a horse to make him follow, to make him do all this hard work to reach the dream. And the dream gives you energy. The dream gives you strength. The dream gives you everything you need, all that, um, uh, all that enthusiasm to, to be willing to fight for it, right? Yes. And so you always focus on the dream. You all never focus. Winners don't focus on the, on the challenge. You focus on the dream. So that's part of becoming unstoppable. Another part is you create a dream team, a dream team. That means you and I are strong, but we're, man, we're not Superman, okay? Uh, if we just try to do everything by ourselves, uh, there can be circumstances that are just going to make us quit no matter, no, no matter how strong we are. So what do you do? You build a, a team of people right? That you respect people that have already done the things that you want to do in life. If you're feeling that you need a little help, man, you give them a phone call and they get you back in the fight. They keep you in the fight long enough to learn the skills. And so that's what, that's another thing. You have to have a, a dream team, a team and you then you, everybody's helping each other out. Yes. So, 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 so those are just a few things but, uh, about how to become unstoppable. Yes, it's cool. Do you have advices to create team? For example, there is People who, are, who don't have any teams, they are in bad mood, they are bad, they don't have, they, they have some difficulties to find their way or their dreams. How, how can we find or build this kind of team? Sometimes, I'm, after a speech, uh, somebody will walk up and this guy might be, you know, 40, 50, 60 years old and, they, and they'll ask me, man, you talk about the dream and so much, but how do I find my dream? I don't even know what my dream is. And it's, man, that's sad when somebody tells you that, right? But that's most of the people are that way. And so I tell them, look, what was your dream when you were 10 years old, when you were 12 years old, when you were 13, 10, 11, 12, 13? What was your dream then? Because that, well, that dream, that's inside, okay? That's in your heart. When yes. you're a kid, it's easy to dream. Uh, and then life kicks you, and then you get scared to dream, right? And so think about that. And that dream will at least direct you to, a, to an industry where you might be happy working. You understand? Yes. And so maybe when you were young, you wanted to be a, a basketball player, mm -hmm. right? Well, it might be too late to be a basketball player now, right? Or maybe you, 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 know, you never did with it, anything with it. Maybe you can be a basketball coach in your local club. Maybe you can uh, work at your local basketball team as a you know, manager or helper or whatever. But being around basketball, if that was your dream when you were a child, it's going to make you happy. And that will give you that power and that strength. And, you know, it won't be work. It will be play, right? Yes. And so that's what I, one thing that I tell them. What did you want to do when you were a kid? And uh, just like uh, Jack Canfield, you know, when I, when I, but even before my first Olympics, I read uh, Jack Canfield's book, um, Dare, to, Dare to Win. And one thing that he taught was make two lists. Make a list of 100 people you want to meet and 100, peop 100 things that you want to do in your life. And every time you, you do one, you put a big circle on it in red, right? And you write victory next to it, yeah? And so as the years go by, you, every time you look at your list, and your list is going to change, okay? Maybe, yes. um, you know, maybe you wanted to be a guitar player. Now you don't even care about the guitar anymore. Now you want to do piano. So it's okay to change. But... Every time you look back at your list, you see all the victories, and that gives you strength too, right? Because yes. you realize, wow, it's look building, at all the things I've done. It's building your self-confidence. Exactly, exactly. Cool. The people you want to meet, people you, you want to, uh, things you want to do. And that, that helps too. But you were asking, you know, my dad, when I was a kid, he said, he would tell me, Ruben, if you have to cross a minefield, right, a field, you know, like in war, you have all the mines everywhere, it's smart to follow somebody that has already crossed it and still has legs, okay? Yes, it's good <laughs> it's, sure. Yeah, always look for somebody that has done what you want to do, right? Cool. Not the theorist. There's many people that, oh, they've read all the books, but they never did it. You don't want to talk to them. You want to talk to the person that did it, right? Yes. Um, a few years ago, I went to Pamplona in Spain and ran with the bulls, right? And before I went there, I read three books about Pamplona and I called one of the authors and I told them, look, I want the experience, but I don't want to die. So what's the right way to do it? They told me, don't stand here, don't stand here, do this, do that. And we ran with the bulls. We ran from the bulls, okay? But, uh, 
but uh, I didn't kill myself. Uh, a couple of years ago, I always wanted to climb Kilimanjaro, the highest mountain in, in Africa, right? And it's, uh, let's see, it's, it's, it's over 6,000 meters high. It's really high, okay? And so we, if I try to do this by myself, I probably wouldn't make it. So what do I do? I found a guy, a coach, you know, and he had already climbed Mount Everest, okay? So for him, Kilimanjaro is nothing. And so he was our guide and he took us up. So always find somebody that's once, you know, and that's how you build your team. Yes. By putting people and associate with winners, right? Associate with people that you respect and disassociate. Get away from the losers, right? Get away from the people that are always complaining because they'll poison your spirit, you know? And I've learned that you cannot, you know, a dreamer will yes. never be understood by a non-dreamer, okay? <laughs> yes. Yeah. So you're wasting energy if you're trying to convince a non-dreamer. It's like speaking, you know, uh, a Chinese. different language. <laughs> yes. Yeah, Chinese or something. No way. It's not going to happen. And so people always so disassociate, you know, and associate with people that you respect. Because you're now you're uh, uh, you're the attitude is at a higher level, right? And everybody helps each other. Another thing, <laughs> I think this is great. Successful <laughs> people, successful people, they like to talk about success, yeah. And so if you ask them, you know, how did you do it? Will you teach me how? Man, buy them a cup of coffee, they'll tell you everything. Okay, just don't waste their time. You know, take action. You know, make them proud of your achievements, right? Because they helped you with the tips, right? Yes. But, so if you want to become an I will, astronaut... I will make you proud of. <laughs> oh, man. I'm, I'm, great. Great, man. So anyway, I'm, hey, one of these days we're going to share the stage. That's going to be fun. Yes. But, uh, yeah. But um, when, when, uh, when I got started speaking, I spoke at a lot of schools. And I would ask the kids, I would say, hey, how many of you guys want to be an astronaut? And always, you know, in a group of... Uh, of 500 kids, there might be two or three that say, <laughs> okay, okay, if I gave you a million dollars, okay, could you find the email of an astronaut by tomorrow in 24 hours? Oh, yeah, piece of cake, no problem. I said, okay, well, guess what? I don't have a million dollars, all right? So you're going to have to do it for your dream. You find the email of, of an astronaut and email them. And tell them, hey, it's my dream. I want to be like you. I'm willing to do whatever it takes. You know, can you show me the way? What books do I need to read? Who do I need to talk to? Okay? Do it. Because now, think about the astronaut that he receives this email. All right? Nobody understands him. All right? All his life, people have been telling him that he's crazy. What, are you going to go to the moon? Are you crazy? Who do you think you are? Are you going to be an astronaut? Nobody understands him. Right? Everybody's been making fun of him. Now, he gets an email from a kid that thinks just like him. He goes, oh, I'll help him. Of course I'll help him. This kid <laughs> understands me, right? <laughs> and, and, and that's how you learn. Yes, I think it's so. It's so simple. It's so simple, you know? Yes. How can we develop courage and why it's so important? Well, courage does not mean that you have no fear, okay? Everybody has fear. Courage means that you have fear, but you still do it, okay? That's, that means you have heart, right? Your will is something about the dream makes you do something special, even though you're afraid. If, if your house is burning down, and I know you've heard this story, if your house is burning down, you're not going to go into the fire to save your favorite book, okay? But if your baby brother is there, you're going to go in, you're going to get burned, but you're going to save your baby brother, right? So what's the difference? Well, the dream was the difference, right? They gave you courage, right? Before, so, so that's a little bit about courage. Now, courage, Aristotle, Aristotle, uh, he said that and he was a pretty smart guy, okay? I mean, everybody's <laughs> still talking about how smart this guy was. <laughs> Aristotle said that whatever you do many times, whatever you repeatedly do, you become like that, okay? So courage is like a muscle, all right? Think of it as a muscle. If you never do anything scary, if you never do anything that takes a little bit of courage, then you're going to have very soft courage muscle, right? No yes. good, right? So let's say that you're going to go to the restaurant, eat dinner with your friends. And always, I'm sure this happens in France too. The waiter comes, 
and he says, what would you like to order? And everybody's afraid to order the first thing. It's always, oh, what do you want? I'll have what you'll have. What are you going to have? What are you going to have? Nobody wants to make a decision because they, they, they think that if they order the chicken, they, that's going to be stupid, right? They're afraid to make the first decision. So next time you go to a restaurant beforehand, you say to yourself, man, I'm going to order first, okay? It's going to be scary, but I'm going to order first. Now the waiter comes, you say, I'll have the chicken or the beef or whatever you want, right? And now everybody orders the chicken because, you know, now it's safe, right? Because you've had the curve. So now you, you did something a little bit scary and, and you faced it and now you're a little bit more courageous, right? Your muscle just, uh, you just did one, one courage, courage one, fear zero, okay? And, and so if every day you do two or three little things that take a little bit of courage, it gets stronger, stronger, stronger. And then one day you decide, hey, I'm going to do something really crazy, you know? And so you can always look back at the things that you've done and that can give you courage in the future. Make sense? Yes. Yeah. So you practice courage every day a little bit and then you become more courageous. 